Well, the topic that uh, Parlas and Salah have assigned me is one that I'm particularly interested in, uh, the Essex low presti uh, injury. And so we're going to revisit some of the concepts about it and really the concepts of axial instability and IOM membrane injury in general. Uh, these are my conflicts, none of which apply really to IOM injuries. Well, one reason that I uh, was particularly honored to accept the Pulver Taft uh, seminar was that my mentor seen on the right here, Dr. F. William Bohr was my hand mentor when I was a hand fellow. And uh, he trained uh, Mass General for Orthopedics and then spent uh, a year doing a hand fellowship in the United States. At those times, hand fellowships were sort of six months. And so he spent six months with Bob Carroll at Columbia and six months with Bill Littler uh, at Roosevelt. But then he took six months and went to Darby and spent time with Guy. And he said that the best training he ever got and what really uh, influenced uh, his joy of hand surgery was the six months that he spent uh, in Darby with Guy Pulvertaft. So in a sense, I feel like I'm paying back for what Bill uh, uh, taught me through Guy uh, overall. So I am glad to be here. Well, the interosseous membrane is involved in a lot of injuries which have uh, names that we've kind of gotten familiar with over the years, going back even before X-ray. Uh, even colleagues talked about concepts uh, of unstable distal radial ulnar joints. Cooper was one of the first to really describe what later became the Galeazzi, uh, and of course, Peter Essex Lopresti. Well, anatomy is important, though it's called a membrane. It really is more appropriately titled interosseous ligament, and leave it to the French Hennequin in 1894 who in his dissections pointed out that it was not just a membrane, that it had very discrete parts. As we begin to study those, probably the best article is Notas, where he's identified the so-called central band, which we'll see is the main portion, particularly for axial stability. We have some accessory bands. We now have a distal band, which is well identified, the distal oblique band, and which plays an integral role, not only in axial instability, but also in distal radial ulnar joint stability. And there are two proximal uh, bands, the uh, dorsal oblique accessory cord and the proximal oblique cord. If there are any residents or fellows out there and they're looking for a project, we still don't fully understand the two proximal cords and what they, uh, what role they play. We obviously have concepts, but they uh, have not really been studied. Uh, well, here's our central band. It's uh, stout, it's about a, a millimeter plus thick. It's about almost 10 millimeters wide. It originates from the radius and goes somewhere on an axis of 20 to 24 degrees towards the ulna. Uh, its origin is about 60% of the way down the length of the radius from the uh, radial styloid and about a third of the way down the ulna for its microscopic stuff. I'm sorry, for its insertion. Uh, the uh, distal oblique band, it runs on the opposite direction. It runs from the ulna to the radius, and it's important. Uh, not only in axial instability, but when we have a distal radial fracture, even though we have a big ulnar styloid fracture, if you haven't disrupted this band and you put the radius back anatomically, you tend not to have instability of the distal radial ulnar joint. Now, in dissections, it's present in about 90% of specimens. Um, as we rotate the proximal and distal aspects of the IOM sort of wrinkle, and uh, in uh, pronation and supination, it, the central band, however, is always taut. So at both ends, it sort of folds, but the central band is isometric and pretty much taut throughout. Uh, one way to think of the forearm, I think that's easiest to think of it, almost as having two joints 
with a center. So you have the distal radial ulnar joint, the proximal radial ulnar joint, and we know in pronation and supination, the radius rolls around that. And it's very much like a, a bucket handle uh, when you're doing it, or you can compare it with a more orthopedically inclined to think of the uh, central band almost as, like the cruciate ligaments and the distal oblique band and the proximal bands as more like the uh, controlling um, collateral ligaments that help stabilize and add to that axial, uh, in, uh, axial stability. We don't tend to think about the, dist the distal radial ulnar joint as a weight-bearing joint, but it really is, particularly when you're in neutral uh, rotation, there is this uh, weight or joint reaction force, and that force is resisted by uh, the DOB and by your central band. And so whenever you have an injury that involves potentially an Essex leprosy, you want to test the distal radial ulnar joint, and you want to test it in pronation, in neutral, and in supination. And you can see subtle instabilities to full-blown uh, transglobal multidirectional instability. And so the osseous contributors to distal radial ulnar uh, joint instability, uh, the distal radial ulnar joint stability are uh, the uh, bone geometry, which accounts for about 20%. And remember that the sigmoid notch accepts only about uh, 50 to 60% of the ulnar head as it rolls around. And so much of the articular surface is against the ligament supports. We have the triangular fibrocartilage itself with its radial and ulnar ligaments. And uh, it is, as you know, supportive and it has really two components, a deep foveal component and a more, uh, a more superficial capsular component. And that used to be confusing because people would argue when you were in pronation and supination, what were the more important fibers? But in fact, they interact together very much like uh, the reins of a, a, a chariot you might be supporting. Uh, the uh, distal um, part of the ECU is also supportive of the distal radial ulnar joint. What is not supportive is the ulnar uh, extrinsic ligaments. They support the carpus, but do not support the forearm. And finally, we have this uh, distal oblique band, which is supported both in transverse and in longitudinal stability. So when we think of what happens when we load the wrist, remember in a neutral variant wrist, about 80% of the load comes down the radius about 20% down the ulna. As it gets to the elbow, it kind of shares between the radio capitella and the ulna trochlea joint uh, with that load sharing occurring across that uh, central band. Um, also note that there is a force which is going to be somewhat transverse as part of that. And it's the oblique orientation of the central band that allows it to support any dissociation between the two uh, components uh, of the radius and ulna on longitudinal forces. But there is also a force across the central band that prevents the splaying of the radius from the ulna on axial loading. So when we look at the restraints to proximal migration of the radius, number one is the radial head. As long as that's in place, the central band and the distal oblique band and TFC complex that we've looked at are really secondary restraints. And so uh, there are many factors that look at the amount of load distribution between the wrist and the elbow. They include ulnar variants, obviously. They include, importantly, the degree of... Um, forearm rotation, the position of the wrist, the varus and valgus positions of the elbow. And so as Markov in his study showed us that, for example, if your elbow is in valgus, that's going to do a lot of load at your radiocapotellar joint. By contrast, if you're in varus, you're going to be unloading that radiocapotellar uh, joint. And that's a normal uh, phenomenon. And so when he measured uh, forces across the uh, interosseous membrane, he found that 
in uh, valgus they were not very high whereas in varus uh, they were uh, high based on the context above the real question is once that radial head uh, major buffer is gone and resected what in fact is the major contributor and this was certainly when i was uh, coming of age uh, in the 80s and, and uh, early 90s was a matter of conjecture whether the distal oblique and the TFC or the central band was the critical structure. Um, Pfeffel and his study showed that with the IOM out, you get increasing load, obviously across your radiocapitella joint because there's no load sharing going on. Well, when we looked at what was more important, there were a bunch of papers that said that TFC was important. There were an equal amount of papers from both sides of the pond that said the central band was most important. We did a study with Jimmy Scan, who was one of our fellows, with little sensors essentially placed in the central band and, and tracking uh, of our position and load, and basically showed that either the central band or the TFC and the distal oblique band were of equal importance once you lost your radial head. So that you couldn't say one was truly more important than the other uh, overall. And so we know with radial head excision uh, and with band disruption, both distally and centrally, we get this longitudinal instability pattern where now the radius moves proximally and uh, causes problems distally, which is the longitudinal instability described by Essex Lepresti. Uh, it also should be noted that there is a transverse force that I mentioned, and this has been not emphasized as much as it probably should, in that uh, aside from this longitudinal force that goes on when the radial head is out, you have forces that are bringing the radius towards the uh, ulna. Uh, Fred Werner uh, looked at this and felt that uh, transverse loading, that the central band contributed about 25%, the accessory bands a little bit more, the proximal bands again a little bit more, and the distal oblique band about uh, 15 or 20%. So when you load this band in a laboratory situation, for example, what happens is very much uh, like Jorge Orbe described when we were talking with boats. If you think of the uh, uh, dock as one bone and the boat as the other, and the cord that is holding the uh, boat from going towards the end of the dock, there is a force which pulls that boat and holds it close to the dock. Well, that's the transverse force. And if you analyze that force, as George, uh, Dr. Orbe did in 211, you find out that pretty much across the board, it's about 18% of the applied force. And so when you're missing your radial head, you not only have longitudinal translation, but the radius is pulled towards the ulna. And of course, we recognize that when we have taken out the other end. If we've taken out the distal ulna and lost its cam effect, we get that impingement syndrome that can be a problem following a DARA resection uh, overall. It also is a problem when we're trying to replace the radial head and we still have an unstable situation. So if you have a short uh, radial head and you've got this force, it may not be able to resist uh, displacement. And we tend to see that. And people say, well, I put a radial head in. Why didn't that solve the Essex Lepresti? Because the transverse forces may, in fact, be working against you and uh, causing an issue. The same is true if you have a bipolar, is that they will often, if you have an ongoing Essex Lepresti and all you've done is address the radial head by replacing it, you may end up with uh, uh, difficulties with your radial head prosthesis. And the data is that it is not the ideal situation. It will not in and of itself give us the kind of stability we need. And so we've lost this force. The radius has moved ulna. It has this uh, 
movement towards the ulna, and we have this classic uh, ulnar positive variant at the ulna. We have this radiocapitellar impingement on the stump, and we have uh, overall impingement. And this was described by Peter Gordon Essex Lepresti. Well, he's one of your uh, UK heroes. Um, he came of age really in World War II, and he was part of the RAF, and he really um, had his major work while he was alive looking at the classification of calcaneal fractures. I don't do feet, but I hear that it's one of those uh, classification systems that's uh, stood the uh, test of time, and he did this by analyzing all the parachuting injuries. Well, when he returned to England, he became a trauma surgeon. And unfortunately, uh, while working on a pelvic hip fracture one night, had a massive heart attack at, as you can uh, see, uh, essentially the age of 35 and died. It was his colleagues who, in cleaning up his office, found uh, his preliminary manuscript uh, dealing with fractures of the radial head associated with distal radial ulnar joint uh, dislocations. And the first case he analyzed was a 46-year-old gentleman with an injury to the forearm, a comminuted radial head fracture. He excised it and watched, uh, to his chagrin, the radius just move up the arm, creating pain at the wrist and pain at the elbow. And so his second case, when he had the same thing, a comminuted radial head, and he recognized that he had this instability pattern, uh, he reduced this to radial on their joint and pinned it and uh, fixed. Uh, remember, we didn't have quite the same good implants that we do now, but was able to get the radial head together. And the outcome was a uh, reasonable elbow motion, preserved rotatory motion, and no secondary surgery. And so the conclusions that he came to was you should preserve the radial head if you can't. If you could not, he felt you should use a sort of vitalium cap, which was uh, one of the developments um, in the early 40s. Um, and he commented that whenever you have a radial head fracture, you should, in fact, look at the stability along the forearm. Well, we now know that there are really two presentations of longitudinal instability or the Essex Lepresti. One is the acute presentation, which uh, we don't always recognize. And the other is one that occurs in a more chronic thing over time and after radial head excision. Well, the acute, though we really talk about the observations of um, Essex Lepresti really was described by Kerr and Co. in 1946, who described the same thing as he did. They treated it non-operatively, lost forearm rotation, and made some speculation that there was a relationship along the line. Really, Brockman, almost uh, 25 years before um, Essex Lepresti, described two cases where the radial head had been excised and the patient had developed a disability at the wrist from ulnar impaction. Well, what's the incidence? One of the problems, it's relatively rare. Um, it's estimated to be 1% of all radial head fractures that it becomes an issue. Uh, Duckworth in a paper, again, looking at a referred group, suggested it might be as high as 9% of injuries. Suffice it to say that in the acute situation, a number of papers have noticed that it is very underdiagnosed uh, and underappreciated. So in Truesdale and the Mayo Clinic study, only 25% were correctly diagnosed and 60% were missed completely. In Jesse Jupiter's study, about under 50% were missed or underdiagnosed. In our series, looking at 106 Essex Lepresti injuries, the initial diagnosis was only made in 40%. And because these often go on to elbow pain, wrist pain, more operations, uh, 
there were uh, some litigious types and they could prove that uh, if you treated it correctly, you might not have an issue. Uh, when we look at late subluxation, um, again, it, uh, there's always a little bit of translation of the radius when a radial head is removed, but many people, it's not a symptomatic subluxation. Uh, only it's estimated about 24% will even notice that they have it. Uh, Taylor, again, an English study looking at uh, patients with uh, radial head excision uh, found that uh, for risk symptoms that there were in his series, a high number who, if you really question them, had some findings relative to the risk. Suffice it to say, if we identified early at the time, we, for example, are looking at the radial head fracture, that the outcomes and first in Jupiter's paper suggested that you can get excellent or good to excellent outcomes in between 80 and 90%. So that's where you can say that if you miss it, you have done uh, some uh, harm uh, and that damage has potential consequences. Uh, Schnetzker in 2017 looked at early diagnosis and treatment where they treated the radial head, they addressed the, the uh, thing, and he found that if it was treated uh, under about four months, that you had a satisfactory outcome at a medium follow-up of about five years. If treatment was not initiated until seven months, they had a deteriorated outcome. So early diagnosis uh, is important in preventing a misdiagnosis. And so you need, I think, defined diagnostic and treatment algorithms. Well, the first algorithm is anyone who's had a significant trauma to the elbow, that's any kind of major injury to the elbow, off a bicycle, motorcycle, ladder, high energy fall, you really should have your antenna buzzing. What's the axis of the forearm doing? We always say you x-ray the joint above and below, but don't. But remember that the IOM, you're not going to see unless there is some variance. And so the first thing I tell our fellows is that while type three radial heads are more likely to be associated with a significant IOM injury, any elbow injury and any radial head injury, in fact, can have some damage if you think about the mechanism of falling on the outstretched hand and how the forces have to translate from uh, your wrist land up to the elbow to create the radial head fracture at risk. Halsman in uh, Germany did an MRI on 14 patients with a simple Mason 1 radial head and looked specifically at the IOM. And he found that if you looked at edema in the IOM, that about 65% um, or two thirds of the patients showed some evidence of injury to the IOM. Now these were all treated as we all do with just a sling and early motion, and none of them went on to, at least in the short term, develop any symptoms at the wrist. Uh, but it should highlight the fact that IOM injury is a part of the sequence. Aside from recognizing the fracture and uh, how it occurred, you can put your finger right on the central band and you want to look for forearm tenderness over the central band. And as we showed at the beginning, instability of the distal radial on the joint, particularly compared to the other wrist, and any of those kinds of things, again, should raise your things. When it comes to imaging, aside from the elbow x-ray, which you're gonna have, you wanna look at a wrist uh, with attention to variants, and often you wanna have a comparison view, and load films can be useful. And so here's someone uh, with an acute injury to the elbow, you're loading them, it doesn't take much force, and you can see the difference uh, uh, between the two sides uh, with uh, load. Uh, here, again, a displaced radial head fracture, uh, you're going to do something, a radial fracture, but despite that, you can see the positive ulnar variance not present on this other side, and right away, you know that the third injured structure here is going to be the interosseous membrane. 
people have looked at the role of uh, a bone scan and you can pick up the radial fracture, you can pick up the uh, uh, wrist fracture, but the IOM itself in general is relatively silent as you see on this acute uh, proven Essex suppressedy where you see the wrist, you see the elbow, but you don't see a lot of pickup on the IOM. As Hausman did, people have looked uh, at uh, the role of MRI and you see these beautiful pictures where on an axial T2, you can see the ligament very nicely. It's 1.3 millimeters thick, as I mentioned. Uh, and here you see it disrupted. And this is a wonderful picture. You say, if I could get that, that's perfect. But in reality, this is done in a cadaver lab where all systems are perfect. When you do it in the acute situation and we send them to at least our uh, MR uh, unit, we often get back swelling around the MR, but they don't get a nice disrupted picture. And so it falls again back on the clinical. And so it's great for dead arms in the cadaver lab. It's very um, uh, less clinically useful in uh, the real world situation. Obviously, we're doing a lot more ultrasound now, and Thala uh, showed, again, beautiful pictures of it intact and uh, disrupted, again, in cadaver arms. And you have the same problem when you're trying to uh, make an absolute diagnosis with the edema uh, uh, obscuring some of the ultrasound uh, detail. Once you have made the diagnosis, however, then you have to have a staged approach to uh, fixing it. And the first strategy is at the elbow. Well, the mantra that we should all remember as Essex Lepresti taught us is save the radial head, save the radial head, save the radial head. And so here, a multi-part radial head, one can argue whether when it gets too many pieces to repair is three or four, the limit. But in general, I make a great effort to reassemble the radial head if I think I can save it. Here, an obvious one where you have a two-part radial head fracture uh, with some distal radial ulnar joint instability and axial migration, radial head fixed, uh, and a foveal TFC repair and suture button and a long term, not long term, but a reasonable follow up at a year and a half with a not perfect rotation, as you can see, but full elbow motion, full wrist motion, full grip, and no late signs of ulnar impaction. Andy Palmer, as early as the 90s, when there was beginning to be more buzz about Essex suppressed, he noted that he argued about fixing all radial heads. And he found that uh, whether he did it acutely or whether he did it because the radial head went on to non-union or he couldn't fix it, that as long as he stabilized it, he had zero incidence of uh, ulnar wrist pain. Uh, Aikida, in his study, looked at Mason type 3 fractures and compared a group that were excised versus a group that were fixed. He found improved strength and function and no risk problems in the ORIF group. Well, we can't always repair the radial head. Sometimes it's dusted and scrambled eggs. And so uh, we obviously need to address, do we need to uh, replace that radial uh, head. And we have an increasing uh, armamentarium of uh, options from bipolar, long stem, uh, monopolar blocks. Uh, we don't use silastic, at least in our country anymore, but there are a number of radial heads. And to this day, none have truly been shown to be more uh, anatomic uh, than another. One can argue, as I said, we all have our favorites and justify them, but uh, at least on Cochrane data, one does not surpass the other. One does have to remember, though, that even in the best of situations, the effect of metal on cartilage um, has never been an ideal outcome, particularly if it's loaded and particularly 
if there are shear forces. And so if you have an Essex Lepresti, putting that radial head in and not uh, addressing the longitudinal forces that it's going to see, I think uh, may doom you to failure. Um, and tuna in a study in 210, a long study at 25 years, as you can see, medium follow-up, noted that in patients who just had their radial head resected, that 81% were asymptomatic, both at the elbow and wrist. So we probably put too many radial heads in, um, partly for the fact that it's kind of industry driven and we're worried about the Essex Lepresti. Uh, he found that there was some loss. Uh, they did have some variance change, but not enough to be symptomatic. There was some loss in their carrying angle and they did develop some arthritis uh, due to the uh, alter, altered load, but still remained a good function. So uh, if you have an isolated radial head fracture and there is no instability uh, and you can't replace it, you can consider an isolated excision. I still think we need to put that in perspective. If there is axial instability, uh, particularly of the longitudinal type, then I think you need to put a radial head in. Uh, and you need to say, well, how do I make that decision? Um, obviously, you go in with a clinical sense of what you think they've got. But when you're there, um, you can do, as uh, Smith and David Roosh uh, showed, if you have a concern, you can kind of do a pull test and compare it to the other side. And if there is greater than three millimeters of shift uh, in the radial ulnar variance compared to the uninjured side, you should be concerned. And if it's greater than six millimeters, then you should consider instability. Uh, Ralph Rennie and I came up with, instead of just a pull test, looking at both the comparison of axial distraction and axial compression, and you measure the difference. And again, it was actually the same number, but you're getting it both by compressing and what the difference is there and distracting and what the difference is there. And if it equals that six millimeters, you have an instability problem brewing. Finally, there is the rail test. You look at your excised radial head and you push down on the forearm and uh, as you load it, you can see if it now comes in as it does there, that's indicative of uh, elements of longitudinal instability. Uh, when do I use a radial head? If I have what I think is true axial instability, if I have more valgus instability than I'm happy with, which is more frequent than not, Again, sometimes I do it for teaching purposes. As I said, I think our tendency to put radial heads in now is a little bit kind of pendulum swung on the industry side um, overall. Uh, but if you just put a radial head in and don't address the IOM portions of the injury, I think you may have problems with your radial head that you that may create problems. And so you need a strategy at the wrist. Well, for me, in the acute situation, I will either do an arthroscopic or open repair, usually of the fovea, uh, as part of my soft tissue to address the distal stability of the TFC and of that distal oblique ligament. One of the new things that we're doing uh, increasingly when we have uh, a distal radial ulnar joint instability or uh, an axial instability is to reconstruct that distal oblique ligament. Uh, there are a bunch of different ways to do it. This is one suggested by uh, Tom uh, Wright, um, but it's a fairly direct and easy approach to do. Um, and here's just a clinical case where uh, we did a brink reconstruction where we used um, essentially interference uh, screws to hold it in place. How about the forearm? Well, the IOM you can find if you just dissect up directly from your fifth extensor compartment, you will drop right down to the forearm uh, through a dorsal exposure and you will see the IOM. 
The problem is when you do that, uh, you will see that about 80%, the majority in the acute situation are central disruptions. As we'll see the tideline of the ligament insertion, both on the radius and the ulna is very strong. And so it fails at the weakest point, which is the center of the ligament. And so you don't find something that you can very easily uh, suture together. Furthermore, the two flaps of the ligament tend to kind of fall away from each other. And there is a little diastasis of the radius from the ulna. And so one question is, um, since the forearm uh, tears, when we rotate it in the acute situation, they don't lie together in any position we place them, either in mid uh, rotation or full pronation and full sup supination. You often get some muscle herniating through and the bones tend to sort of gap apart. Uh, Werner in a study looked at the uh, gap that occurs uh, and found it was significant when you disrupted uh, the IOM, which again explains why they don't just fall together and lie together. That then calls into question whether pinning for six wakes, or as some people have advocated using a, almost a syndesmotic screw uh, for two or three months, is really doing anything to um, allow that IOM to really uh, heal. My own personal bias is it really does it, and I don't particularly do that anymore when I have an axial longitudinal instability. Uh, Gary Kuzma uh, and David Roosh came up with a very no novel concept, which I think is nice to use sometimes when you're augmenting an acute situation. And this is called the pronator teres IOM uh, downturn. Essentially, uh, what you're going to do is the um, radial portion of the central band originates uh, really about a, a centimeter or two uh, proximal to the pronator insertion and inserts on the ulna at the um, origin of the pronator quadratus. And so if you make an incision and expose the pronator teres, you're already anchored at that end and you take a fascial strip of the pronator teres. You can kind of tighten it down a little bit with an anchor if you want. And then you take it at that arc of 24 degrees distally and attach it to the ulna. And so it's a somewhat elegant uh, solution. There's your forearm incision. Uh, here you see us during a case, you have to watch out for the posterior interosseous nerve as you do when you're doing any of the reconstructions. But rerouting the pronator teres um, is actually fairly easy to do. Some of the studies in the laboratory, however, have suggested that while it makes a good augmentation, I think in the acute situation, it probably doesn't have the oomph in the chronic situation to really uh, hold uh, axial uh, stability. Um, in one uh, study looking at one of the newer things that we're using, uh, suture buttons, uh, uh, such as uh, the type rope, uh, it was found that using an artificial construct like this can certainly provide some uh, stability. And um, we looked at a study in 216 in relatively acute Essex depressity, where aside from addressing the elbow and the wrist, uh, we addressed the IOM deficiency with just uh, a type rope. And at least in those situations, it seemed to be somewhat uh, helpful uh, with, again, fairly short term under uh, four years outcome uh, with reasonable restoration of grip strength, no secondary surgery. We did see we were able to maintain ulnar variance within about 0.5 um, millimeters. And so it does seem to be, at least in the more acute situation, a reasonable thing. Uh, Siegelman followed that and used it in a more chronic area where, along with his ulnar shortening, 
uh, and um, stability at the wrist, uh, he used it uh, with reasonable results again at the five-year level. So currently in the acute Essex depressity at the elbow, I'm gonna fix the radial head or replace it. Uh, at the distal, I'm going to repair or reconstruct to use the DOB, the fovea or the distal radial ulna joint. And for the mid portion, I'm either going to, in the acute, I'm either going to augment it with a PT transfer or some type of suture button currently. And uh, that's been my things. And so here we have someone, uh, acute injury, 49 year old, bicycle crash. Uh, we can see the immediate ulnar variants. The uh, radial head is in a series of pieces. Um, and we did exactly what I said, radial head prosthesis, uh, reconstruction of the IOM and uh, distal radial ulnar joint at two years, no pain, great motion, good grip. Here's his variance down the road. Here's his radial uh, head uh, and variance maintained and back to all activities. Well, how about the chronic longitudinal instability? This is one where you don't and can appreciate potentially uh, the instability, whether it's missed or whether it's subtle and only becomes important over time. And uh, here, you obviously now, when they come in, because they usually come in with wrist pain, they may come in with some elbow stiffness, but their main complaint is they now have wrist pain. And classically, this occurs nine months after the injury in our big series. So it doesn't occur within the first six weeks. You've already discharged the patient. You've either excised or replaced their radial head. You're happy, they're doing well. Suddenly they're back on your list and you say, my, what's the matter, George? And you say, well, my wrist is killing me now, doc. And now you see um, that they've developed uh, ulnar impaction. Well, here you're going to address it usually with an ulnar shortening to do the things, we have a number of different uh, plates, ulnar shortening, probably one of the best procedures we do for pain on the ulnar side of the wrist. Uh, you wanna end up, when you're finished, to be about two millimeters ulnar negative, not neutral, You because it's going to subside whatever you do a little bit. I tend to, um, at the time I do my ulnar shortenings, to scope the wrist, to allow me to appreciate what's going on with the LT, to look at the TFC and to breed it uh, and to address the impaction lesion. At the time I do an ulnar shortening, um, it allows me, I think, to get a little more freedom of wrist pain earlier on than the ulnar shortening. If I have arthritis already from a chronic Essex lepresti like we see here, you could, one strategy would be to shorten the ulna so that just the very distal aspect of the joint works. Or now, at least in this country, uh, some of us are using a distal radial ulnar joint prosthesis developed by Dr. Shecker called the Aptus prosthesis, which looks like it should fall apart after a couple of years, but uh, has been uh, an amazing feat in most of our cases in terms of providing distal radial ulnar joint instability. It does help with longitudinal instability, obviously, because you fix the radius and the ulna. And so far in 10 year follow-up studies by Hamill, by us and by Jupiter, uh, it seems to be standing the test of at least a modern follow-up with a uh, very functional motion uh, and excellent grip. Um, as I said, for the second time, we worry about the load of a radial head on that, particularly in the axial longitudinally with instability, and I think most are doomed. Um, and so when uh, Anne Ouellette uh, did a study in the lab trying to figure out what things made most sense in a, a lab model, the Herbert sling is her reconstruction of the distal radial ulnar joint. The bone ligament bone is patellar tendon. Uh, she found that the best outcomes in terms of restoring it to uh, its uh, strongest portion was when you used a bone ligament bone and uh, a radial head implant. So you needed both 
Uh, again, as we talked about, uh, I will consider radial heads when there is uh, valgus deformity and for the longitudinal insufficiency. There have been a number of strategies to look at stuff. We've talked about the type rope. We've talked about the pronator, Terry's turned down. Uh, but there have been a number of strategies, and almost every tendon in the arm has been looked at to try to uh, reinforce or to replace the central band from palmaris longus to FCRs to double FCRs, et cetera. Um, and in a study uh, by Prosper Menheim, uh, looking at that, they found that the um, best uh, mimic of the uh, IOM was the patellar tendon uh, overall, but no graph reconstruction was as good as your native IOM. And that led us early on, uh, before that study, this was actually done uh, clinically, was to use a bone ligament bone reconstruction. Initially, we used all autograph, but subsequently allograph. And like all things, it was somewhat fortuitous. Um, we had a hand fellow who uh, had also done a six month sports fellowship. And when we, we were looking at that time at bone ligament bone reconstruction for the uh, wrist ligaments, and we came across an acute Essex lepresti said, well, uh, you've talked about issues you're having. Why don't we take a bone ligament bone from the knee, which seemed like a major hit, but um, he was willing to harvest the graft. So he said, okay. And the patient said, yeah, I think I'll do whatever. And so we did it and developed a series on it. Subsequently, realizing that as hand surgeons, we don't like to fool around with the knee at all, um, that uh, allograft might equally work as well. And so when we do use a bone ligament bone graft, it's now mainly uh, allograft. It's critical to know where to insert it. Uh, you really want to get on the isometric area. We initially uh, kind of uh, thought it was about 60% of the length of the a radius for your radial uh, placement and about 30% um, or so for its insertion on the ulna. As I say now, um, because we know that it's isometric throughout the change and significantly shorter in supination, um, we now tend to place the graft in about 70 of supination. And from studies recently, Jang pretty much confirmed what we've been doing clinically that your best isometric points are going to be 1.5 centimeters proximal to the insertion of the pronator teres on the radius and for insertion on the ulna right where the pronator quadratus uh, inserts. So how we do it, you expose uh, the radius between the ECRL and ECRB, watch out for the dorsal radial sensory nerve, find the origin of the pronator. We then inset the uh, bone ligament bone, usually by carving it and fixing it to the radius, pass it across the wrist, again, watching out, particularly for the PIN, and then attach it distally. We've done an ulnar shortening in these uh, chronic uh, cases, and you sort of countersink, as I said, we do tend to put it in the supination, realizing it'll stretch out just a little bit. Here's kind of what it looks like in a cadaver uh, that Pani Dantlori, uh, one of my partners uh, and I were doing. You can see the ulnar shortening. When you do put an ulnar shortening plate on and you're going to put a bone ligament bone, we tend to put the ulnar shortening plate either volarly or on the uh, outer side as opposed to dorsally. We're going to pass a graft, as I said, obliquely, somewhere about 20 degrees at the insertion of the pronator. Here we've made the incision a little bit bigger. You can see the insertion of the pronator and the direction. That is actually the IOM in this uh, cadaver. We're going to take a bone, ligament bone, thinning it out uh, to have a nice bone to bone construct, fix it uh, in our initial set point tunnel it across and reattach it uh, into our prepared trough on that side and countersink it with a screw. Uh, it's really fairly straightforward. Um, 
the one thing you do have to watch out for is the very terminal branches of the uh, posterior osseous nerve that go to the index and the thumb uh, extensor, though we fortunately and never had a complete loss of either of those. Uh, this is what the final construct looks like, an ulnar shortening or two millimeters negative ulnar variance. You can see the um, insets of the bone ligament bone there. And this was a series that we followed up for about 10 years. It started in 92. We've had 46 patients who we followed. Uh, the majority are males. And again, they're usually a pretty young group because of the injuries they sustained are not fragility fractures. They're usually fairly high energy. Um, the initial diagnosis of a longitudinal instability was made in only five of the 46. Um, many, this is an early series, had been treated elsewhere with silastic uh, implants uh, for their uh, radial uh, head. Um, in this series, the radial head was removed uh, primarily in about uh, two thirds and secondarily in another. Uh, some had silastic radial heads, which were, this is in the 90s, remember, uh, and the average time of late resection was about five months. All the silastic prostheses failed, as we know, and the IOM was identified between nine and 10 months post-radial head excision, with 75% being seen under uh, two years. Um, prior to undergoing the reconstruction, the group in total had a bunch of uh, surgeries where they'd shorten them and, it, and then the, the shortening would fail or they put another radial head in. Uh, this is a, a tattoo of a zipper that one patient had tattooed. And many of these were referred uh, to yours truly for one bone forearms, which uh, we'd written an article on for um, ultimate um, uh, salvage for forearm instability. Uh, and while that sometimes helped with the forearm instability, it wasn't the optimum functional outcome. And so that's why we kind of inherited this. The ulnar variance on average was 3, millimeter, three uh, millimeters in uh, a load uh, picture. There were some with some arthritis. Well, at 10 years, no patient was worse. The wrist pain improved in 93%. Um, elbow arthritis over time worsened a little bit in 12%. There was no radio capitella impingement. Now, the unusual thing about this series is because we really only had silastics on some very bulky uh, radial heads, all patients in the series were radial headless. So we didn't have a radial head prosthesis to even help us unload that. So we had to depend upon the bone ligament bone to reestablish the axial stability. Uh, we had no secondary surgery for ulnar variance issues. Uh, when we uh, looked oops, at their, uh, sorry, um, when we looked at their grip strength, it improved. We restored about 80% uh, of functional rotation, uh, looking at their DASH and uh, patient-related wrist evals. Uh, they uh, all improved. Uh, sort of a classic case, you can see where we started pre-op at about three to four millimeters, two millimeters negative post-op. And if you look at one year, uh, 11 years, you see that we're about one millimeter. So we lost about a millimeter of subsidence um, overall, but still functioning. And when we looked at the series overall, the maximum loss was about two millimeters. Uh, we did have some complications. We had two ulnar non-unions and smokers, a couple delayed non-unions. We had one extension uh, extensor lag and a couple. We had one transient PIN of the uh, EPL and the index, which came back. We did have some knee soreness uh, in about 19%. Nobody developed unstable knees, but just uh, when they were running or doing uh, exercising. So I had the fortune to um, 
basically have a patient who, having had her Essex Lepresti corrected, was riding a horse and fell again and got a distal radial fracture that uh, we decided to fix. And in doing so, uh, we were able to get a biopsy of the reconstructed bone, ligament bone, and at least under uh, H&E staining, it appeared to be a normal uh, ligament um, per se. And so uh, as we finish, um, relative to acute injuries, prompt diagnosis, early treatment, and a strategy at each of the levels of injuries with a chronic injury, ulnar shortening, reconstructing it somehow with or without radial head replacement. And, you know, I think always treating an Essex Lepresti is a little bit like sailing uh, in a high wind. It's an adrenaline rush. It's sort of a, a little bit of angst when you do it. It's a learning experience, but hopefully the treatment algorithm presented will result in a happy outcome for both you and your patient. One of the futures, this is a, a, a new device that Jorge Orbe has come up with. I have no uh, role in it, but it's essentially using a fiber cord that can be tensioned so that you can set your tension of your uh, central band. So you no, don't put it in as we show in this cadaver, but basically uh, you make a cut by the pronator teres, place it through there, bring it through one side, and then can tighten it. So there is some other things. We may not need a bone ligament bone in the future overall, and that's just the things. And that pretty much finishes, and I'll stop sharing and come to things, that pretty much finishes the uh, presentation.